Today we have uh, Herb Smith, Professor of Philosophy and Religion. Uh, Herb will be uh, sharing with us about near-death experiences. And Herb went to Monica about this because he was inspired by uh, Dr. McGregor's uh, spring talk about the soul. So Herb right away got hold of Monica and said, hey, I want to talk about this. And of course, Dr. McGregor will speak later on this fall and I can't remember what the topic, but it's kind of like part two of what he did this last spring. So it, uh, it will be uh, great to hear from him. Without further ado, Yay. <laughs> we'll have Herb come up and talk about near-death experiences. Okay. Herb. Oh, thank you. Bob, Bob has me on the iPhone, and what does it say there, Bob? <laughs> so you asked for it. <laughs> it was uh, 30 years ago I first did this type of presentation for the Pennsylvania Chautauqua Society. It was a Thursday evening, hmm, not exactly prime time. Uh, there was torrential downpour of rain and I remember driving there with Gene saying, I regret that I accepted this assignment. Whoa, when I got there, nobody knew me so it wasn't me. The whole place was standing room only on Thursday night. Uh, three women had driven from New York City, 200 miles, sitting on, they had Jewish backgrounds, sitting right here to tell their stories. A woman had spent over $1,000 to have her am an ambulance bring her there to tell her story. A guy sitting right back there uh, was from Penn State University, he looked like a hippie out of the 1960s. He had been freebasing cocaine at Penn State and wanted to tell his story. And that was 30 years ago. This was a new topic then. This is sort of like a highlight topic. Now it's uh, sort of common knowledge. It's in movies, uh, novels, uh, autobiographical statements, uh, what have you. The founder of Hard Rock Cafe, Isaac Tiggett, uh, was reckless. I mean, that's putting it mildly. One day he was driving his Porsche along Big Sur uh, area of California. He was stone drunk, no seatbelt of course, and he went over an embankment several times. Didn't learn from that. Later he was in Oklahoma City, the buckle of the Bible belt, okay? He was in Oklahoma City and he was freebasing cocaine and then it looked like he was gonna swallow his tongue and he thought, lights out, I'm dying. He had a near-death experience, came back, and he liquidated all of Hard Rock Cafe. That turned out to be $216 million after all the bills were paid. Aha! $108 million. If you study Hinduism and the Far East, the really cool number is 108. And yes, he gave half that money, therefore $108 million, to hospitals uh, in India. My wife, Jean, is the oldest of nine children. Uh, her younger sister, Gail, just died in recent years at the age of 50. Uh, and uh, Gail's husband, when he was in his 20s, was working at Musselman's Food Processing near Biglerville, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And Gail was there too. And he inadvertently caught his right hand in the food processing machine. All the fingers were severed, okay? Uh, Gail, of course, was beside herself, 911. Here comes the ambulance to go to the York Hospital. On the way, Donnie said to me, the pain was like unbearable. And then he heard them say, I think we lost him. And up above he went. He not only could see the roof of the, uh, the van, that is the 911 vehicle, but uh, the city lights and everything of uh, York, Pennsylvania. He went back in his body, they resuscitated him. Here comes the pain. They tried to have surgery and transplant a, uh, at least a, 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 a toe to his uh, hand here so he'd have at least some prehension, unsuccessful. Weeks later, another toe, unsuccessful. Now I'm gonna be candid because you'll never meet him, okay? Uh, Donnie was, prior to this, one of the people I used to avoid at family get-togethers reunions. You know those kind of, okay? After this, he's like one of my favorites. Now, what kind of guy was he? Was he a, like an egghead? And, uh, you know, I could have my fingers severed and perform fairly well reading, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, he was a construction worker and a football player. And last time I checked out, you can't throw a football very well without fingers. 
He had such an incredible experience of God's love, it totally uh, transformed uh, who he was. Another anecdote which may be a bit emotional. Uh, I had a parishioner who had uh, cancer in his brain. And uh, the cancer growth was getting so large, he had to have part of his skull removed, and he wore an oversized hat. He lived about two blocks from the uh, church where I was a pastor, and he, he's 35 years old, electrical engineer, PhD in engineering from MIT, all right? He comes down and would often rap on the window, and I'm so serious, and he says, Herb, smell the roses, okay? Well, now it's time for his surgery. And he developed agoraphobia or agoraphobia. You know what that is? Fear of getting out of the house. Some people have this, and they spent their entire lifetime indoors, almost. If they have to get the Wichita Eagle Beacon, they run out and get it and run back. Well, he was just two blocks from the uh, church, so he didn't mind coming down to church for worship and to see me, but oh my, was he afraid of going to the hospital. And he consented to go to the hospital only under this condition that his car would be parked in the parking lot of the hospital with the keys in the ignition, his bed would be rolled right to the window so he could look down and see those keys so in a fit of fright he could go home. The Sunday evening before uh, the surgery, I'll never forget this, several of us went and we did the Church of Brethren anointing service. You know what that is. You may have been a recipient. Chris has done that wonderfully uh, for me. And uh, so we anointed him. We sang the Lord's Prayer. We left. We're out in the hallway so he could be alone with God. And then he sang. And he should not have been able to sing because most of us sing who are not trained from the right side of our brain. His right side of the brain is all cancerous. He had surgery. What happened? He told me, oh my goodness, Herb, in the middle of the surgery, kaboom, the bright light. I was taken up above, and my agoraphobia and my fear of dying vanished. 35-year-old man, PhD in physics, beautiful family with three kids, nice home. I mean, he had it made. He died shortly after that, but he died in peace. Uh, Gene and I have had the pleasure of going to 60 different countries. I have presented this material in Japan, in India, and it, my friends, is universal. I've presented it uh, several times there. What percentage of Americans have near-death experiences? How many have had it? Approximately, we think, about 15 million. Now, of the people who have shared with me, which is 75 to 100 people, I've stopped counting, how many of them have shared with somebody else? Hardly any at all. They haven't shared with their, their spouse, their kids, uh, certainly not their pastors or their rabbis or their gurus. And oh my goodness, certainly not their MDs, their doctors. Okay, the vast majority of our MDs, as you know, over 60% are atheistic. Uh, if you have a religious experience, don't go to a psychiatrist. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association is 95, 90 to 95% atheistic. So if you have religious experience, my goodness, this is neurotic. It's, in fact, it's psychotic. Okay? Uh, it does not mean that any time that you're out, that you're unconscious, that your heart stops, that you are going to have a near-death experience. Uh, I was out in India for an hour and a half before they brought me back. And uh, I had no experience at all. But my life was saved by this woman here who had a near-death experience. Okay? Uh, somebody gave me this years ago. Maybe some of you know this guy. Uh, he is a graduate of Mac College uh, in the uh, 1980s. Uh, Scott Carpenter, automatrist. This goes back to the year 19... Uh, uh, 1990, Scott Carpenter, one of our Mac graduates, this is in the Topeka paper, was uh, going home or going to a relation get-together for Thanksgiving. His car went over an embankment, hit cement, and kaboom, he was wiped out. He had, uh, I think, 12 different surgeries on his face. His face was so mangled, he refused to look at the mirror for, for weeks on end. 
He had 40 different screws put in his face alone. And if you see him on this picture, he looks quite good, really. Near-death experience, life transformed. Sometimes people go through dramatic events and they don't have it. Uh, uh, Kendra, Jerry's wife, Bowen, and I have permission. I've had, I've had Kendra sometimes share my classes. She's an incredible human being. Uh, Kendra and her mother, I've had her mom in class, had a, an accident in which somebody was drunk hit their car. Now, if you can't see this, how in the world could anyone get out of there alive? It was the jaws of life that pulled her out there. She was resuscitated five times. Usually they stop after three. She was brought back five times, but no near-death experiences. About one out of three people who go out and come back uh, report this. Okay, let me share with you some of the features. Some of you know this. I'd be totally surprised if there aren't people here who have had and will have time for you to share. This summer I presented for Chautauqua Society. I cut off 20 minutes early. Good grief. I had to cut it off after an hour later. People went on and on and on of the experiences that they had, that they had not shared at all with anyone else before, and now they were doing it, uh, my goodness, in public. Okay, some of the elements which you've heard, this is now pop literature. Uh, people sometimes say they go through a tunnel. They experience a bright light. Now, if this is cross-cultural, then you would expect different cultural elements to enter in. Uh, you cannot take off these glasses. Uh, almost all of us here are Euro-Americans, okay? I have a, oh my goodness, this morning in class, so I brought the class to our house, and our uh, Luel uh, from, uh, from Kenya told about how his brother and sister were burnt to death. A Congolese woman uh, is there, Joyce, who escaped with her life from the Congo, okay? Uh, uh, people uh, are wearing different cultural glasses, and you and I can't take these off, okay? You, you might try, but I'm gonna be scientific, gonna be objective. No, we can't take these off. Every experience is culturally uh, colored, and that's pretty obvious. Um, when people see the bright light, if they are like you and me, most of us here, what do we call it? God or uh, Jesus. If you're, if you're Roman Catholic, uh, the Virgin Mary has never been bigger. The Virgin Mary has never been bigger in, in uh, I went to a whole conference up at KU a few years ago on appearances of the Virgin Mary. It was not a Catholic conference, it was a, a conference of sociologists. So if you're Catholic, you say, the bright light, that's the Virgin Mary. If you are a Buddhist, like in Japan, uh, you would say it's this figure here, uh, Avalokitesvara, or in their terms, Kuan Yin, who is a female or an androgynous Buddha, a Buddha who's both male and female going both ways. The woman who's, whose life uh, and whose experience saved my life is a transvestite. She's a cross-dresser. Uh, when Gandhi was dying, when he was shot by that right-wing fanatic, he's dying and he is saying, Rama, Rama, Rama. Uh, we had Gandhi's grandson in our living room and I asked him about that. And uh, Rama was the key word that Gandhi used for God. So he's seeing the presence of God as he's going to uh, the life hereafter. Sometimes, not always, people see relatives. I remember visiting one of my uh, favorite parishioners when I was at Bryan, Ohio. Visiting me in the hospital, he was a truck driver, and uh, always joking, so that's why I enjoyed him. Sitting near the edge of the bed, and then he says, Herb, and then he starts crying. Well, what's wrong, Allison? He said, I didn't believe it. I come to church every Sunday. I didn't believe in life after death. Uh, as pastors, I think we should be aware that a good percentage of the people in our congregation are agnostic, skeptical, whatever. We're not all on the same page theologically. And then he said, when I had that heart attack in the restaurant, I went up above and I saw my son who was deceased for 20 years. And I love my son. And there is life after death. Sometimes people see relatives. Sometimes there's a time review. Uh, I had a student who was in an accident in California, not wearing a seatbelt, and she went over an embankment and her car went over five times. Uh, now, how would she know five times? Have you had a slow-mo experience? Have you had that? 
do you even care to share, Jan, one, or, or well, would you? It was just a, a minor car accident, but the car slowly tipped on its side, and I swear it must have taken 10 minutes to do that. There you go. Yeah, you could, you could uh, check out your checkbook and everything. I, in Wichita, Kansas, just several years ago, we're on the way to the Asian Festival, and we're about to go through the sex intersection. Here comes a guy from Bangladesh, of course he didn't have insurance, driving a pizza uh, outfit. And I said, we're going to hit this guy. And I say to myself, why didn't I take the other car? Why are we going to this Asian festival? You know, a whole myriad of things, and then bam. <laughs> uh, Slow-mo happens to us when we are psyched up, and sometimes it's incredibly helpful. Uh, in sports, it's phenomenal. I mean, if you could, promo, if you could promote or uh, initiate slow-mo, you'd be the best baseball hitter like Ted Williams in world history. Uh, now. This woman had all of her birthday parties go before her. Some people say they've had their whole life flash before them. Wait a minute. Just to see half an hour of life is too long. No, no, no. I believe that time is completely elastic. Completely elastic. Uh, uh, Albert Einstein uh, actually believed that everything has happened simultaneously. That's kind of nauseating, isn't it? So people, when they say, oh, I've seen my whole life flash before them, yeah, you probably could have seen a lot more than that. All right? Now, uh, I teach in academia, so uh, we don't accept everything just because people tell stories. Uh, by the way, I have presented this before friendly audiences and not so friendly. I uh, presented this at Ashland Seminary. That will be my last appearance there. <laughs> <laughs> They called me uh, the devil and everything else. I've been called, uh, I did a presentation on this for the gifted uh, children, uh, middle school kids. Eight, count them, eight people walked in with tape recorders. Not because they thought I'm gonna be special. They wanted to take that back to their Sunday school classes and critique it. I've been called every name that you can imagine. I've given this presentation to uh, the Unitarian Universalists up in uh, Salina. And there, when you do a sermon, they critique your sermon before the next hymn. <laughs> and I mean, like no holds barred, they critique it, and they thought I was the most gullible person on the face of the earth. So you have people from the right, the left, and the center who get very upset with this material. To me, it's enlightening. Um, so what's going on here? Some say it's conscious fabrication. People are making up these stories. Well, if they are, how comes everyone's making up practically the same story and usually not telling it to anyone? Or the usual one of psychology, Ron Siegel of UCLA, is unconscious fabrication. Uh, when you and I go to bed at night um, and the lights are out, our senses don't have input, and then the right side of our brain says, Duh, I'm bored, let me see a movie, so it creates a dream, okay? So as we are lights out, dying, duh, the brain creates this near-death uh, sequence, okay? Autoscopy, auto means self, scope means to see. Uh, autoscopy is a rare experience, but it's incredibly profound. Have you ever even heard of this phenomenon? Um, people with narcolepsy, that's a third of my classes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Narcolepsy is you can fall asleep like that. I mean, you could be bowling, you know? You're bowling, and then before you release the ball, fall asleep right there. So people sometimes, right before narcoleptic seizure, have this. Schizophrenics sometimes have it. Um, the only person ever reporting it to me was a woman, and this is really a lot of grief, folks. She was waiting as her daughter gave birth to triplets. And as her daughter is giving birth to triplets, the medical staff is coming out and saying, it's deceased, it's deceased, it's deceased. All three died in sequence. And she said, I experienced myself outside of myself, and it was horrible. Aristotle, the great philosopher of ancient Athens said, if you see yourself outside of yourself, uh, it means maybe that you in fact will die too. Narcolepsy. Uh, drugs, oh my goodness. Uh, People like a near-death experience, especially to lysergic acid 25, or to ketamine, uh, angel dust, PCP, all kinds of drugs. Uh, uh, when it was legal, believe it or not, Harvard University did
Divinity School gave uh, Divinity uh, students LSD uh, and, and some not LSD for a communion service. And then did they have a religious experience? Did they not? So some say it's similar uh, to that. Endorphins. What are endorphins? They're the morphine of the mind. That's what makes you feel good uh, when you're having your kick of uh, caffeine or whatever. Uh, I ate a cookie before you, at least one, uh, before you all arrived. Uh, and where did I have the endorphins? Right down here. Same chemicals in the brain, same down here. Uh, so some say it's endorphins being released. That's why you feel good. Endorphins, though, usually make you mellow. You know, like you run three miles and then endorphins and you feel mellow. After near-death experiences, you are not mellow. You are kicked up, just the opposite. Uh, the one that's most intriguing by far is the temporal lobe epilepsy or temporal lobe seizure. Uh, I remember reading in USA Today, not exactly a learner journal here. Uh, it was a sports page. That's why I used to read it. Uh, it was the uh, St. Louis had a football team, remember? And uh, a wide receiver, this is in the sports page, it said, a wide receiver went out to make a catch. He was hit by a cornerback, and he had a spectacular experience. This is right, you know, with the scores and all the statistics. And then it went on, that's it. And uh, here, later, the next day, it said again, it was at the right temporal lobe. Epilepsy is a plague, and some of you may have been afflicted by that. I had seizures when I was a child. One time they thought I was gone. My, uh, my aunt, my great aunt, brought me back to life. We have no idea what she did. She took me in a room and, and uh, you know, did she pray? Did she pour water? Did she slap me? I came back. I had several seizures. Uh, epilepsy is not something you want, except if you have right temporal lobe epilepsy. Fedor Dostoevsky had that. And Fedor Dostoevsky was a political critic, duh. And you know what they would do to really get him? You know, your, your trigger, seizure's gonna be triggered when you're nervous. They'll be triggered at any time. Did you see the, uh, the Emily Dickinson movie this summer? Emily, Emily Dickinson having grand mal seizures. I, I had no idea. Maybe that's why she was a loner. I could understand that. Um, so, Fedor Dostoevsky, they would take him up to a stage in front of everybody, put a noose around his neck like they're going to hang him. And then he'd have a seizure, of course. What they didn't know was that he had a right temporal lobe seizure, and it was absolutely glorious. And he said, I would give my life for a split second of one of those seizures. If there is a place that God has pre-programmed in the human brain, the hardwire of the human brain to receive God's presence, it's got to be the sylvan fissure of the right uh, temporal lobe. Hypoxia. Hypoxia is the deprivation of oxygen. Um, students, not in recent years, hopefully they wouldn't share this, used to tell me in the dorm, the guys, they would grab each other, have you heard this? By the gut, hold them until they just about passed. Did they do this when you were on campus, David? You can tell the truth now. Okay, no. Just, just things that I've heard. But you, <laughs> oh, of course, David was so pure, okay. <laughs> All right, guys would, the women wouldn't do this, I don't think. They'd grab a guy, hold him like that, and then they'd have an incredible high, and then let him go. Well, duh. Uh, do, you, do you remember Barney uh, Halbert, the, uh, the physician who was here? In, in, uh, he was a friend of the Breemeyers. You didn't know he used to play the piano at the restaurant? Okay, Barney worked for uh, Planned Parenthood in Hawaii. And he, he had, at Yale University, he had translated the Hippocratic treatises and all that. He was really sharp. He said not a week went by as a physician that a young person wasn't brought to him who had all kinds of physical problems because somebody did this to have the high. I remember reading in the Wichita Eagle Beacon that uh, this young high school student would come to dinner and his parents want to know, well, what the heck are these rope burns doing around your neck here? And of course he didn't tell them. And one time he didn't come down from the rope. He would hang himself temporarily in the basement to have the high. Now, oxygen de deprivation, my daughter lives Duh, over 9,000 feet above sea level, west of Denver. When Gina and I go there, it's like, it takes me two days to recover. It's not a high for me to, to have lack of oxygen. If anything, it's mildly depressing, okay? But people sometimes love it. 
and uh, test pilots almost become addicted to lack of oxygen. Hypercarbia is precisely the opposite or quite different. Hypercarbia is when you have uh, a great amount of carbon dioxide. Believe it or not, in the 1950s, one of the psychiatric practices was to give people carbon dioxide. <laughs> Take some carbon dioxide and call me in the morning if you can, okay? Now, a professor at the University of Michigan, today, the whole university would be sued and shut down. They took a bunch of college students, voluntarily, huh, and put them in a room and then pumped in carbon dioxide. Now, what do you think happened? Well, they, they became nauseated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but some of them got high, and some of them became preoccupied with, are you ready for this? Mathematics. Boom! Mathematics. Sometimes people who have near-death experiences, it's rare, but it's really cool, they become, they come out of this coma, and now they love math. And I don't mean three plus four is seven, I'm talking about quadratic equations. They can't wait to get to the library. They may have been stupid in math before, and now they love it. Now, if you think that's weird, Plato, when Plato is asked, well, what's it gonna be like in heaven? Uh, how much geometry do you know? Okay, uh, uh, same way Bertrand Russell, who was a non-believer, non said the closest we're gonna get to heaven is mathematics. Mathematics are eternal. When Albert Einstein said, I wanna read the mind of God, he doesn't come up with poetry, he comes up with E equals plus or minus MC squared. God thinks mathematically. So anyway, it's curious, isn't it? Now, the final one explanation uh, was given by Carl Sagan. Remember Carl Sagan? And by the way, Carl Sagan was uh, you know, absolutely brilliant. He was an atheist all the way, but his wife, uh, what was her name, Jean? Ann something. She helped to uh, send that disc into outer space. Uh, Carl Sagan, in his last, or maybe his wife's last novel, wrote about a near-death experience. Wow, you wouldn't expect that. Carl Sagan says, you know, when you're in the hospital delivery room, uh, you're going through the tunnel of your mother, coming out of the womb, into the bright light, the nurses are holding you, that's the near-death experience, it's a primordial memory. Now, the last one, which is not on here, is the one that I would hold, and I believe in their authenticity. What's incredible is, we're living in the most skeptical age in human history as far as the United States of America, okay? Uh, at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, when we were there, now we're talking about back in the 1970s, less than half the people who came to church believed in life after death, okay? So we're talking skepticism here, folks. And to me, these experiences are absolutely uh, incredible. Um, before I go over some of the research, uh, would you like to share it all, or does anything catch your uh, attention here that you'd like to inject or critique? <clears throat> yes. My mother had a near-death experience when uh, one of her children was born. She was very allergic to quinine, which was a painkiller that was used to be given. And um, she um, had given birth, and my dad left for a little bit. And they, of course, the staff had instructions not to give her quinine. He came back into the room, and she appeared to be gone. And she said during that time, she was up in the corner, and of course, Dad stepped out in the hallway and hollered like crazy and got somebody in there, and they were able to bring her back. Um, she never really said a lot about the experience, except she just remembered yeah. being up in the corner and watching down while they worked on her and brought her back to life. Yeah. But she never said she didn't remember the tunnel or doing a lot of the things that have been reported. Yeah. Okay, and people have some aspects, not others. Usually not the whole package, so to speak. Thank you. My grandma told me several times. My, I owe my religious faith to my grandma. I was brought up in a four-generational household. She read to me from the Bible at least a half hour every day. And grandma told me about her experience. And you know what I thought, even as a child? Sentimental grandma. I didn't believe her. So I even had skepticism as, as, as a child in that way. Um, let me share, and maybe some more. Yes, Doris? Well, I'm just going to comment on your carbon dioxide thing. Uh, that's what we use when somebody gets high altitude. 
illness. We give them a bag to breathe into and out of, so that's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so carbon dioxide helps that cough, helps get them down. Yeah, and when I have a coughing, sometimes I have allergic coughing, I, I put a, you know, sort of mask here to get in, so. Yeah, so it can be therapeutic is what you're saying. Yeah, it sounds unusual. Let me share with you some of the research, and my, oh my, oh my. I'm impressed, you may not be. Dr. Michael Sabah was a cardiologist at the University of uh, Georgia, who, like most cardiologists, would think this is total nonsense. So uh, he said, nonetheless, I will check it out. So he asked uh, his clients, his patients, who had heart attacks and had no experience, and then those who had heart attacks and had the experience to share, how are you resuscitated? The ones who didn't have experience, every one of them got it wrong. They didn't know how they were brought back. Those, and it was 30 some, who had the near-death experiences, all but two gave great, uh, uh, what should we say, picturesque examples. There were three people there. This is what they were wearing. They tried this first and then they tried that second. He was so convinced by this that he became, from an atheist, a Presbyterian minister, now he teaches at the University of Florida. Dr. Kenneth Ring uh, taught at the University of Connecticut, and get this, he has the anecdotal evidence, and it's only anecdotal, from 19 people who were blind during that time. 10 of them congenitally blind, blind from birth. Now, if you talk to a blind person who's blind from birth, do they dream with imagery? No, okay? Uh, so 10 of them have been blind from birth. Of the other nine, uh, some of them became blind between three and five at an early age. What did they report? They reported that when they went left their body, they could see everything 360, baby, all around. If like if they had experience here, they could see all of you. And they could describe it. Now, they couldn't say Roger has a red shirt on because, you know, red, they couldn't identify colors, but they know it's a certain shade. And they could see everything. And then back in their body, totally blind again. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, there is an old body, there will be a new body. The Apostle Paul, look at him in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he says this. After he goes through the litany of all his troubles, he says, I know a certain Christian guy who 14 years ago, hmm, uh, went up to the highest heaven. In the age of the Bible, he has seven levels of heaven. I don't know, he says, whether this actually happened or was a vision. I repeat, I know this guy was snatched up to paradise. And then he says, he heard things which cannot be put into words, things which human lips cannot speak, etc., etc., etc. Duh, I think he knows this guy quite well. I think it was Paul on the way to Damascus, and that's why we have Christianity today because of a near-death experience. Uh, Elizabeth Keebler-Ross is perhaps the most famous of thanatologist. Uh, Ken, did you go to that class on uh, seminary? We all went down to meet her one time before she was famous. Elizabeth Keebler-Ross's life is incredibly interesting, uh, to say the least, but I, I, I won't take time to share. Elizabeth Keebler-Ross is brought up as a psychoanalyst. That's a Freudian, neo-Freudian, I mean, in Freudian, every, all religion is neurotic or psychotic. Okay, it's a mental illness. But she had so many people telling her near experiences that she believed in them profoundly. She spoke at the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren. That's the church which she and I go to often during the summer. Now, the E-Town Church would hold what? 600 people? 650? Half an hour before she presents. Uh, it's not only filled in the main area, but even in the basement and she talking about near-death experiences. Also, one of my parishioners, I was pastor at the Ridgeway Community Church of the Brethren before coming here, and Dr. Richard Kaur, who works as a, a psychologist for the Department of Education, has done lots of research uh, in this area. Now, what happens to people who have near-death experiences? What are some of the side effects? Sometimes, of course, not always. Sometimes people have synthesia. Do you know what that is? Somebody want to give it a try? Yeah, you know, Jan. Synest synesthesia or uh -huh. synthesia? S-Y-N-thesia. It's not anesthesia, it's synthesia. 
One of our professors has this. It, it's what I think you're talking about. It's a crossover of senses. You got it. You got it. Yeah. So I could be drinking this coffee, excuse to drink, <laughs> and I've seen colors. Okay. Uh, I look at numbers and I hear music. So one sense is crossed over with the other sense. Now, uh, children often have that and outgrow it. Uh, adults rarely have it, uh, but one of our professors has it. And man, you know what he can do to, to begin a class? Students have told me this. Class, give me numbers. So they put up here maybe 30, 40 numbers. Okay, all right. Uh, see them now. Well, somebody copy them down. Let's erase them. At the end of the class, he will tell what the 30, 40 numbers are. Why? Because he saw colors. Okay? So if you can cross uh, your senses, and people with uh, near death experiences uh, frequently re report that. Extrasensory perception. I love working at McPherson College. That's like. Duh, is the Pope Catholic, okay? Uh, Gene uh, brought me, drug me here 35 years ago. It was a 51% decision. I didn't want to come here. I thank Gene every week. I mean that literally, as Gene, sometime. Every week, I literally, after 35 years. But I did have a bad two days. This is years ago. And I got up in the middle of the night at around two th or three, walked to Lakeside Park, came back. Now. Dutifully in my office at 8 o'clock, and here at my office door was a big sign, Herb, this is your day, and here's some candy. I go to class. It was a woman student, a middle-aged woman student. And I said, well, that's really cool. Uh, you know, this has come at the right time, because last, last night, she said, yeah, I know about last night. Now you would think, oh, I bet she lived in me. No, she lived 20, 25 miles away, and she knew my experience. <laughs> She had a near-death experience when she was 17, a swimming accident. And she, since then, has this gift of sometimes tuning into people, not all the time. When her father, grandfather was dying, her grandfather was afraid of dying, and she led him through the whole dying process. Uh, and she's a, a public school teacher there today. Uh, Richard Core, especially, in his research, uh, finds this. Um, women who have near-death experiences often are more assertive, duh. And men tend to be more, uh, what, communally minded, socially minded, just the way we should be more androgynous. As we age, we usually uh, become that way anyway. And the appreciation of life. If you ask people who have near-death experiences, do you believe in God? They will say, do I believe in God? I know God. It's like, do you believe in the table? <laughs> You believe the table's here? I, yeah, I think so. It's like self-evident. It is self-evident. And I think it's uh, the most incredible thing now in our age. How many Americans? Perhaps, and there are what, what 324 million of us, uh, uh, about 15 million of us. And most of those have shared with no one. Um, I, in class, go over cross-cultural stuff. Uh, I'll put that aside for a moment. Let's go with children. Do children have these experiences? Indeed, of course, or it wouldn't be genuine, for goodness sake. It's not like it starts when you're 12. Um, uh, Kenneth Morris, who's a uh, MD from uh, Seattle area, uh, did the research on children. And as long as they're able to talk, then they can share it. If they have it before that, obviously they can't share it. I remember when I was pastor in Bryan, Ohio, a woman said to me, uh, I was going for groceries, and this is before we had all these seat belts, you know, in the carts and all that, and she's taken out to the parking lot, and her kid falls out of the cart, hits a head, comes back and says to his mom, I was with Jesus. Now, do you think the child said that to make his mom feel good? I doubt it. Jean's sister watched a child die at Lake Michigan. She lived in the Chicago area. And the child kept on coming up for air, but never came up the last time, obviously, and died. And was uttering some, what she thought was some uh, religious language at one point, we don't know. Uh, children have this experience. I have, uh, Gene knows this, I have 4,000 books, okay? You want some books? Come on over, all right? At our house and at our cottage. Now, 
How many, Jean, Jen knows this. Okay, how many of those books are on children, would you think? Huh? If you guessed one, <laughs> that is it. One book on children, why? Because we don't look at the religious life of children. It's kind of cute, isn't it? Hi, you had experience with Jesus? That's cute, isn't it? Meaning not authentic. And we have totally overlooked the religious life of uh, children. Uh, do you have any extra anecdotes you'd like to share before we uh, conclude? Well, that book that came out a while back about the, the family's son that went to heaven and, and discovered that he had a sister or a brother that had gone there earlier was very interesting. It sure was. It was shown at the Salina Theater, Gene saw. And uh, uh, do you know what church it was uh, filmed at? Was it not the Holmesville Church of the Brethren? It was the Church of the Brethren in Nebraska where it was filmed. Was it the Holmesville Church or one of those? Yeah, incredible. What was the title? Uh, Heaven, is, Heaven is for Real. Heaven is for Real. Heaven is for Real, yeah. Any other uh, expressions? I will not share personal stories of people that you know, and I always try to guard because I respect the in that way. Otherwise, I could share experiences of people that you know and you say, oh my goodness, okay? It is rare that our students have it because of their age, okay? It's people my age with heart attacks and, and whatever that have it. Uh, here is uh, Lali Bella. Lali Bella was the king of Lasta in Ethiopia in the uh, 1200s. And when he was a little kid, six, seven years old, he and his brother vied for the throne. His brother was bigger and stronger. And he gave Lolly Bella some beer to drink laced with poison. And for a whole 24 hours, Lolly Bella was in a coma, close to death, probably went beyond. When he went beyond, what did he see? He saw the new Jerusalem. And when he was resuscitated and he eventually became king, he built the new Jerusalem and Gene and I take students there, uh, what, six of the last eight years. The New Jerusalem in Ethiopia is, uh, oh my goodness, nine churches monolithically carved, mono means one, and lith is stone, half the size of Moore Library. Into, well, Jen, you've been there. I mean, it's just, it's just like nothing there. And Roger you, and Carolyn, you've probably been there too. So near-death experience uh, produced that. I'll conclude with this one here, and this may be emotional. Uh, this woman, when she was 13 years old, her dad decided to kill her uh, because her skin was too dark. So in careless state, uh, he took her out and tied her to a tree to kill. He tried this several times, and this time he thought he did it, beat her to death. And she went into a coma and then she went beyond the coma and then came back. And uh, she had the experience there of God, et cetera, et cetera, and God's presence. Now here, if we'd have this here, we'd send her to Prairie View and put her on tricyclic drugs and that would be the end of it. She had the feeling that she, in fact, was the presence of God on earth, which we would say, oh, well, that's megalomania, okay? And now here in our culture, no way. But in India, they believed her. And she was the one that set up a hospital in the middle of the rainforest of India, shaped like a lotus plant, uh, where I was for, uh, for 26 days. It was uh, about 10 of those days that they thought I was not going to make it. One time I was out for an hour and a half, and then I was resuscitated over and over and over again. She is now 63 years old. Uh, she travels around the world. She comes uh, to Washington, D.C. And there are 30 Anglos, Anglos, people like, look like me, in Wichita who actually follow her. OK? Uh, Jean and I went to meet her in Washington, D.C. because we never met her. And there were 40, uh, excuse me, 4,000 people there. And she spoke to an interpreter. 
And uh, when the, she walked in the room, everyone hit, you know, prostrating, whatever. And I said to Jean, if she's the God on earth, we're in trouble, okay? Because <laughs> she wasn't profound. But I got down my hands and knees and waited six hours to meet her and to thank her and to get hugged from her. She's in my uh, World Religions textbook. She's called The Hugging Guru. Now, here's a woman with an income enormous. Is she like Oral Roberts and putting up a university for herself, et cetera, et cetera? Is, uh, is she like uh, Billy Graham, who was worth 37 million early in life? No. She gives all of her money to the education of girls and to hospitals around where. And here's the, the final line. She, uh, in her hut, she lives in a hut. She could live in a mansion. There's a picture of Jesus there as a model for her lifestyle. What about Jesus? Uh, I said, what do you think is the most incredible experience of Jesus before Holy Week? I think, and Tabor College is named after it, when Jesus goes up to Mount Tabor, and here he meets who? Elijah, who had been deceased for 800 years, and uh, Moses, who was deceased for 1,200 years. And he is so transfigured, his face is aglow. I think the transfiguration was a near-death experience. And when Jesus is on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, you have all these, the seven last words of Jesus. But when he announces God's presence, I think that's what was happening. And as a pastor, those of you who've done pastor work or just simply visited your loved ones, isn't it something, you're visiting somebody in a hospital and they're getting worse and worse and worse. You say, oh, they're gonna die soon. And then one day you go in and oh my goodness, why they're awake and alert. And you say, oh, they're gonna make it and then they die. Why is that? I think it's the last lap around the track. And I don't think that we walk that last lap alone. I believe in God's presence. Thank you.